we're really happy to have Dr. John Goodburn today. And so I guess he is at the moment based in Athens, Greece, right? Uh, running Real Mode, which is um, a kind of environmental, kind of experimental studio working at the intersection of art, architecture, and also ecological pedagogy. So, and I guess he also contributes to seminars um, both at the Royal College of Art and also UCL uh, Bartlett. Some of you might have also seen his work at the Making Future School uh, or might have read his book, Scarcity. I know like we, we read one of his very early papers uh, on urban political ecology together in the, in the second week or so of our course. Um, so personally, um, my encounter with Dr. Goodburn's work starts with, I guess, his PhD thesis, uh, which was a kind of a critical reflection or kind of a revisiting of what I would call a critical cybernetics, which was the kind of second order cybernetics. And some of you have already been introduced to cybernetics, right? Um, but the cybernetics that kind of emerged in the 1960s and 70s as a response to some of the more reductivist ideas of feedback uh, that were in place um, as part of the, the, the post-war, let's say, military industrial complex. And so Bateson was part of this. And there were also other critical thinkers like uh, Umberto Maturana, Francisco Varela, Heinz von Foerster. And what are, one of the in, it, like really interesting things in Dr. Goodman's thesis at that time was how he was starting to connect these ideas, which kind of existed, to a broader um, kind of discussion on politics and let's say the urban political ecology and the whole idea of um, relation that exists in I would say Marxist ecology but also Harvey and, and other thinkers and trying to see how this kind of second order cybernetic notion of relation or Bateson's notion of relation might be able to kind of enrich this other kind of political discussion. So I guess he's been working at this and this research has progressed much much more beyond that. So I'm really happy to hear from him, um, you know, kind of the latest state of his research and how he is working with it at the moment. So, um, John, it's up to you. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the invite, Lamini, and, and thank you. It's, like, it's nice to meet you all. It's fantastic to see a seminar series on, on Bates and unfolding. So I really do appreciate the, the invitation. Um, and yeah, I'll try, we were just discussing beforehand, there's a, there's a few, there's a number of things I want to try to get through today. So just so you've got it in your head, I'm going to start by um, very briefly introducing what's at stake in some of Gregory Bateson's later work. I'm then going to take a step back because in order to make progress on that, we need a bit of a bigger picture of his, the evolution of his thinking. So I'll give, I'm sure for some of you, you, you'll have different degrees of familiarity, but I noted that it was fairly early on in your seminar series so that um, uh, hopefully I'm not retre retreading too much ground of, of just going through the, the key points in, in the evolution of his thinking. And one of the things, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to do that is because there are various interpretations that I think it's important to make to help to frame the material. And actually, in particular, around political questions. Because on the one hand, Bateson does, on the one hand, avoid certain kinds of, of political questions. But actually, there, there is actually a very definite um, series of engagements within his work. And I wanted, although I'm not going to be able to, to um, go into detail on all of those today. I wanted to flag them up to you. And then this also actually further expands out into a bigger understanding of, of um, cybernetics and actually that within a bigger field of, of systems theoretic thinking. And then I want to close um, today by, look, by pulling all of these kind of themes back together again and looking at what I think is one of the reasons why it's important to continue reading Bateson and what some of the contributions that he's made are that could be useful for us today in some very, very contemporary questions, such as, you know, well, at least should be coming out of COP and Glasgow. I mean, actually weren't, but, um, 
but regarding what um, has actually been increasingly called in the last few years, the, the dialogue around the Green New Deal. So asking questions about actually, you know, implementing a climate justice, political ecology driven um, transition. And, and, and some of the cautionary tales that I think we can usefully get out of Bateson's work. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to start sharing screen. Okay. So can you see the title page there? Okay, everyone? Yes. Okay, great. So, and, and some of this I've got scripted because there's a lot of material that I want to get through and, and I'll try and stick to my script, although I regularly don't, but then there's other bits that are much more informal anyway. Okay, so on his death in 1980, Gregory Bateson left an incomplete manuscript on the epistemology of the sacred. Writing as a lifelong atheist, he was tentatively trying to describe a particular way of knowing that he thought could be found in and understood through the conceptions of the sacred and the aesthetic, and which might in fact be essential to understanding and working within ecological systems. The claim here is significant and profound. It is that attempts to perceive ecological systems and even worse, or even more importantly, attempts to intervene in complexity with conscious purpose and planning and without a meta-aesthetic moment, are not only generally doomed to failure in terms of achieving their initial goals, but are more importantly, just as likely to initiate a cascade of unintended consequences. And I have it actually in brackets here. This is already a point where there's a, a certain kind of tangency or a, a alignment between some of the things that Bateson is thinking about and some of the things that Marx and Engels were thinking about. So we normally think about Marx and Engels as, if you like, talking about the irrationality of the market and an unplanned economy and talk about, you know, how can we have some kind of democratic planning rather than planning by private corporations. What's often not so well noted is, is they actually themselves knew some of the... Um, issues with this, and, and I'll, I'll touch upon a couple of those as we move forwards. Okay. So Bateson claims in what ended up being the final book, um, which is, so out of this manuscript, um, the, the remaining manuscript, that it was always intended to be co-written with his daughter, Mary Catherine Bateson. Mary Catherine Bateson was his eldest daughter and comes from his first marriage with Margaret Mead, the in many ways much more celebrated anthropologist than, than even Bateson was. And Mary Catherine Bateson herself became, only died um, uh, earlier this year and, and herself was a very significant um, thinker actually kind of, you know, extending some of, of, of her father's work. So, so she um, completed the project after Bateson died, working with the remaining manuscripts, but playing with the fact that um, this was intended to be a co-authored book and to some extent a dialogic um, uh, book. Anyway, in here, in the introduction on page 14, Bateson opens with one of the tasks that he, he was setting this book, which was that in a non-dualistic view of the world, a new concept of the sacred emerges, which is a kind of interesting and curious statement. And I should just say, yes, yeah, so, so what, what does he mean by dualistic here? So, so what he's referring to is the whole inheritance of Western Enlightenment thinking, in particular, that strand that um, bear, you know, is, is ascribed to the coming out of the philosophy of Descartes, but actually is much wider than that. But essentially is 
you know, the separation between body and mind or mind and matter. Um, the fundamental dualism that sits at the heart of, you know, what we would call the, the, the European tradition of thought, which is, which is obviously expanded much more widely, um, but, but it's, it's, it's important to give that classification because there's many other epistemologies around the world that don't share that kind of dualism. Um, and it was it was something that Bateson was 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 you know his his in a sense his his life's work in a sense was about trying to overcome that this this idea that these are two completely separate substances that you've got mat that you've got matter and that you've got mind and these two things you know uh, uh, don't explain each other um, and rather his seeking to arrive at what you'd call a monist position where actually you can um, think about what has been categorized by the term mind by actually organization such that what you're looking at in the study of mental systems is the study of organized systems of organized material systems so that so that you know mind always emerges out of and is imminent within the way in which material systems and in particular living systems are organized and this is something that we'll, we'll come back to a few times okay let me get back to my text so in this paper i want to review some of the material that i've been working with recently which comes from this later period of bateson's writing and teaching practice and in particular where he is developing the concepts of aesthetics and the sacred as secular systems theoretic concepts and I will conclude by drawing out some cautionary principles in these concepts that, that we might introduce into our thinking when it comes to consciously intervening in planetary systems, which is, you know, again, just to make this point, I mean, we are, we are always intervening in planetary systems anyway, um, as a part of them. But, but the, the, you know, the, all of the discussions that have been going on in the last two weeks are about, you know, attempts to intervene and and direct those in some way whether it's about you know reducing carbon uh, emissions and so on and so forth but there's and, and and there's a series of important qualifications to the to, to these challenges which um as i say i'll reflect on at the end however before i do that i want to take a few minutes to have a quick history and overview of who this character gregory bateson was and moreover, to situate his thinking within a wider um, body of emerging um, systems theoretic thinking and the politics of it. So to start with, I should probably say a few words about the term cybernetics, which in no doubt you're hearing coming at you in all kinds of sources from all kinds of directions, which you're probably realizing already contains that those different uses and definitions of the term cybernetics contain contradictions, contain descriptions of very, very different kinds of things. So whenever we come across the term cybernetics, we need always, like any term, you know, we need, we need to ask who's, who's using it here, in what context, when are they writing? And, but cybernetics is, is an especially um, complicated term in that it gets used by different people in some very different ways. And just to, just to kind of, you know, give a, um, uh, you know, a, an overview of that in, in a sense. So, so on the one hand, you know, there's a certain understanding of, of, of uh, as Domini yeah, introduced earlier in, in today's session, that, that there was a cybernetics of cybernetics that emerged as, as a second order or critical cybernetics um which in many ways was almost a kind of liberation philosophy you know i mean it actually spanned from thinking about the self thinking about living systems thinking about what it means to think thinking about what it means to learn um very interestingly a huge number of important second order cybernetic thinkers ended up having some kind of relationship with buddhist thinking which you know really bears is, is very very interesting, or, or and 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 is actually worth reflecting upon. 
And yet, and, and so there's that kind of understanding of, of, of cybernetics is, is almost a kind of liberatory thing. But you will also come across completely the opposite interpretation of it, which actually, again, in, in, in terms of the um, you know, brief introduction that, 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 that you've already had, comes out of more first order uses. But you, you, for many people, you could ask, well, what, what do you understand by cybernetics? And they'll come out with saying something, okay, well, it emerged out of the World War II, you know, missile development program or something. Complete nonsense, really, actually. I mean, that is one of the things that fed in to that. But those discussions, and, the, and like the Macy discussions, the key conferences that happened from the, in, in the immediate post-war period, they had already started pre-war. And actually one of the um, interesting things is actually how some of people like Bateson and Mead, what they were doing in the immediate pre-war period, which I will mention briefly. So, so first of all, actually we need, you know, the claim that cybernetics came out of military thinking is a claim that the military made because they wanted to control this. It's actually a claim that we should be very suspicious of. And actually it has m m many, many different sources feeding into it. Now, more importantly than that, if you like even, is that that particular flourishing of, of, of if you like, historic cybernetics that, that emerged in the middle of the 20th century and then its self-reflective moment in, in the decades after that. And then the, the proliferation of thinking that then followed out of that, whether it's the kind of chaos and complexity sciences, whether it's certain moments within contemporary new materialist thinking, the ways in which it's fed into, you know, the, the incredibly productive areas around sort of feminist ecological thinking that, you know, come out of, for example, where Bateson ended up at the University of Santa Cruz, University of California, Santa Cruz. One of the things that he was involved in helping to set up there was the History of Consciousness program. And the History of Consciousness program to this day is, is an absolutely central, um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's been run by feminist ecologists for, for you know, sometimes so Karen Barrard, Haraway, um, Anna Singh, um, you know, many of the um, Isabel Stengers of all are there or passed through there. So, so there's a great deal of contemporary radical thinking about biological and material systems that, that, you know, has come out of this stuff. But actually, if we go back in the other direction, we can also, you know, see how, how that moment of cybernetics was actually part of a much bigger history and turn of thinking and which in um and which actually does go back again to this um non-dualistic view of the world if you like or the realization that as in in as capitalism was unfolding in europe from like the 15th century onwards at the same time, you've got a cultural revolution happening in Europe. You've got, you've got the, um, the Reformation and the Enlightenment, which co-evolves, <laughs> to, to use a cybernetic term, co-evolves with the emergence of, of capitalism. Now, and, the, and as I've already said, yeah, is actually one of the things that happens there and, and in this mutually supporting way is that the entire world of material objects, the entire world of non-human living systems are just seen as essentially dead things. So they're seen as objects and they're seen as, you know, not containing, um, you know, either not containing souls in the, in the Christian sense or even just not being conscious. And if we think about, if we look at the kind of methodologies that were starting to emerge within the sciences as they begin to emerge, as they begin to be defined. So we have a whole, a whole current conception of academia kind of emerges in this period and, and it emerges through primarily a reductive, a reductive reductionist methodology. So that is breaking things down into disciplines and subject areas, breaking whatever those subject areas are down into smaller and smaller parts, and the same with the objects of study. 
So matter gets broken down into molecules, then into atoms, then into subatomic particles, into quarks and so on and so forth. Or in the biological world, you know, animals are broken down into, you know, their organs and then their cells and then their genes and then their DNA. And this is a very, very productive method. I mean, it, it, what you, you can produce a certain kind of knowledge by doing that. But what you're not doing when you're following that method is you're not seeing the whole. You're, not, you're breaking things down into parts, but you know, if you cut a cat up to see what it's made of, you've no longer got a living cat in an environment. You've instead just got this series of parts. And so actually right from, and certainly by the 18th centuries and the, um, you know, once the reductive sciences and the reductive method is well established, you've already got the realization that actually something is missing and that we need systems of thought that can think totalities in various ways and can think wholes in various ways. And so this is actually how, where certain kinds of system thinking start to emerge. And, um, um, and actually ecology as a paradigm effectively starts to emerge. Now, I know that you've read the earlier paper, so I won't don't need to recount all of that history. I, I touch upon various bits of that there. But it's worth noting that, and this is just one of those moments of, of tangency within my bigger project of, of reading Bateson and Marx and Engels together amongst others, is that this is something that Marx and Engels, interestingly, were, were very aware of. And if you like, part of their bigger philosophical project was actually a criticism of materialism, materialist philosophy. So when we say, when we talk about materialist philosophy, we're talking about a way in which, if you like, the whole of Western philosophy was, can be divided into two camps, if you like, what's called materialism, and idealism. And these actually don't mean what they mean in everyday uses of the terms. So what is meant by materialist thinking is actually to say that we don't need to use any supernatural descriptions or anything to describe what's happening in the world, that we can just look at matter, look objectively at matter and can actually, you know, everything can be described out of that. Idealism, on the other hand, claimed that actually, if you like, a certain principles of organization, or it very often just took the form of a deism of, you know, effectively supernatural intervention, you know, God creating things, um, but in more sophisticated forms. Now, so on the face of it, and, and I mean more than on the face of it, yeah, Marx and Engels were both materialist thinkers. They were absolutely dedicated to the project that we don't need to, you know, invoke gods or anything in our descriptions um, of the world. But they recognized that materialist philosophy up until that time had no mechanism for dealing with change, no mechanism for dealing with process, was actually not very relational. So it was tending just to view the world as a world of objects that could just be cut up and broken up and you would just, you know, look at these things. And so they developed a call for, for a dynamic um, uh, materialist philosophy that could incorporate ideas about organization, which for them was dialectical materialism. So they took the work of an idealist philosopher, Hegel, who was, look, who was you know, entirely driven by the unfolding of ideas and in their terms, turned that on its head. Now, I can't go much more into that here, although there's a few things, I, but this is, and in, in both Marx and Engels, there's, and as you saw in the previous paper, there's all kinds of um, um, ecological thinking going on. This is actually one quote that I didn't, I think, have in that um, um, addendum paper, which, which is out of um, Engels' notebooks. And so this is him writing this in the 1870s. And I think if we read through this, we'll actually see a whole bunch of anticipations of um, actually effectively second order cybernetic thinking. 
And it, it presents a challenge to straightforward ideas of planning already. So, so you know, people think, oh, you know, Marx just wanted, you know, democratic planning, but they, but they realize that the complexities within this call. So Engel states, let us not flatter ourselves over much on account of our human victories over nature. For each victory, makes, for, for each such victory, nature takes its revenge on us. Each victory, it is true, in the first place brings about the results we expected, but in the second and third places, i.e., you know, that this idea of recursive feedback here, it has quite different unforeseen effects, which only too often cancel out the first. The people who, in Mesopotamia, Greece, Asia Minor, and elsewhere, destroyed the forest to obtain cultivable land, never dreamed that by removing, along with the forests, the collecting centers and reserves of moisture, they were laying the basis for the present forlorn state of those countries. When the Italians of the Alps used up the pine forests on the southern slopes, so carefully cherished on the northern slopes, by, by you know, in, in the area you guys are now, I guess, or bit, for a bit just south of you, um, so carefully cherished on the northern slopes, they had no inkling that by doing so, they were cutting at the roots of the dairy industry in their region. They had still less inkling that when that they were thereby depriving their mountain springs of water for the greater part of the year and making it possible for them to pour still more furious torrents on the plains during the rainy seasons. Thus at every step we are reminded that we by no means rule over nature like a conqueror over foreign people, like someone standing outside of nature, but that we with flesh, blood and, brain, flesh, blood and brain belong to nature and exist in its midst. And it's a fantastic, piece of writing I think that anticipates so much of the of the you know sort of contemporary thinking but also you know anticipates the need for this kind of systems and relational thinking and, and, and again there's a there's a another moment of it here and then within um you know there's, there's then within if you like the wider Marxian canon there's all kinds of interesting moments of, of trying to extend this so so I think as like uh, Alexander Bogdanov in, who was actually almost running the Bolsheviks at, 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 at one point in, in the early years of the 20th century in the Soviet Union. They had a very interesting systems theoretic um, concept of, of tectology. So the point, one of the points is that in a, in a sense that, that cybernetics is a particular moment within a much bigger turn towards realizing that we need to understand how systems are organized, how systems organize themselves, um, and what a dynamic materialist um, um, uh, kind of philosophy or method might be, that actually, amongst others, you know, Marx and Engels had kind of sort of started this project. And the, in some ways we can think about, you know, why did then cybernetics emerge in the way it did in the United States, but elsewhere, I mean, as a key point to, that, that, you know, so I'm, I'm always cautioning to not fall for the, for both the US centric and the US military centric histories of cybernetics, that is actually much more diverse, spans a much bigger time period. And yes, I mean, they, they need to have a, a dynamic materialism. The dialectical materialism of Marx and Engels is obviously completely forbidden, if you like, and taboo in mid 20th century America. Um, so it kind of needs to be reinvented. Um, but it also is, you know, by that time, the realization has, has expanded into um, uh, a much greater number of, of fields as well so that by the time the Macy conferences um, are starting that there's there's a, a wealth of evidence that, that simply wasn't available in the 19th century. Okay so I wanted to give and I can we can reflect a bit more on this later but I wanted to try to set what is not necessarily an orthodox understanding of the history of systems thinking and cybernetics but actually to sort of say that the cyberneticians and actually Marx and Engels in the 19th century are engaged in similar projects in, in certain senses. So, okay, so we've, we've got this more complex understanding. Let's now have a look at this character, Gregory Bateson, and, and, and just the, 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 the sequence of, of experiences and thinking um, that he went through. So Bateson 
Born 1904, dies in 1980, born in the UK, um, born to, to William and Beatrice Bateson. William Bateson, his father um, was an important biologist. He um, was one of the people that helped to popularize Mendel's um, uh, genetic theory. Uh, but actually, it's, it's kind of interesting to reflect upon what is the class, you know, what was the class background of Bateson, Gregory Bateson. And, you know, he's in an interesting position, you know, the UK doesn't really have a big, you know, if you like, history of the intelligentsia as a class. But there was, a, but there was a, a minor thing of it. And, and Bateson would definitely, the Bateson family would definitely fall into that. So they had been scholars for many generations at Cambridge, at St. John's in particular, where Gregory Bateson did his first BA in biology, following in his father's footsteps. Um, but several generations of the Batesons had been involved in St. John's College, that they were hanging around with the Whiteheads, with you know uh, Alfred North Whitehead, the important process philosopher, with the Darwins, you know, that there was a certain group of, of intellectual families around Cambridge through the 19th and early 20th century. And this was the, the if you like, the, the background to Bateson's um, position. And I was thinking the other day, you know, did he ever engage in any kind of directly capital processes? And actually probably not. I mean, he's, he's you know, neither, I mean, obviously selling labor in academia in various ways and semi-independent research projects. But it's, it's you know, this, this kind of um, somewhat surplus position of, 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 of a, um, uh, or, or this, cl yeah, this class position that, that's, um, yeah, intelligence, so we say. I, th I think it's important to, to note that class position, but because it, it does constrain his ability to think politically at certain moments, I think, or the way in which he does. Um, now, what can we say? So, so he, he initially studies biology, but then moves on to anthropology by the 20s. So he's in his 20s, um, is already, um, has, has gone to uh, Papua New Guinea, New Guinea, um, works with a number of, of uh, cultures in New Guinea, some more successfully than others. Um, he actually does a bit of teaching in, in Sydney for a year in linguistics. And there's a book that comes out of his early work, Narvan, which is actually worth looking at. And it's worth looking at, for, especially because the, the epilogue, there's an epilogue that he writes for it in 1956, which is actually a very, very interesting summary of some of his thinking. So it's a very interesting book itself. It's based on the, the term Narvan is the name for a very particular ritual within the Iatamal culture, which was the one that he ended up um, looking at. And it's, it's a, it's, it was basically a transvestite ritual that got triggered within this culture whenever a significant event happened and which was, was the event around which Bateson theorized this concept of schismogenesis. And so schismogenesis was effectively his moving towards an understanding of feedback within cultural systems. And there were two forms of schismogenesis, complementary and symmetrical. And so a complementary schismogenesis is actually almost like a negative feedback system. It's actually where um, two tendencies that, that could tear a community, a village apart, balance each other out. Whereas the complementary schismogenesis is actually more like positive feedback where um, you get an escalation of, so for example, like an arms race or an ever increasing scale of conflict and which will ultimately rip um, the society apart. So he was interested in how, you know, what these processes were. He realized that these were unfolding um, and and I guess the, he then meets, during this period, he meets Margaret Mead, um, who was also doing some work in New Guinea at the time. They then, in the 30s, or then also go to Bali, do a big project in Bali, and that produces the 1942 book, 
Balinese character. Now, what's interesting about that is that they're using what for them is new media in quite a radical way. So they're making a lot of film, a vast amount of photography, which is actually Bateson's primary um, uh, role. And they're interested in the relationship between the body and bodily movements of individuals and the patterns within the cultures as a whole. And, and they're, they're working on, on the thesis that there's some kind of interesting relationship between these two things. Now, what then happens, and this is touching on some of what have actually been largely underwritten, but there's, there's actually quite an interesting account in, yeah. yeah. In this uh, relatively recent book by Fred Turner called The Democratic Surround. And the first half of this book actually spends quite a lot of time looking at what Bateson and Mead were doing in the 1930s. And it, it's not an exclusive, exhaustive account, but he actually covers that fairly well. And they're actually engaged in a radical political project because at this time, they, they've, they've now returned to the States. Margaret Mead was, was, was American. Bateson, you know, as we said, was from the UK, but settles in the States at this point. And, and, and apart from various kind of bits of uh, field work is, is largely based there. Um, now, at this time in the 1930s, we have Hitler as, as, as seized power in Germany. And it's starting to expand. We have fascist movements in, in other parts of Europe, sometimes already in power. At this time, they are primarily concerned with the prospect of fascism in the United States. Something we don't often think about today, but which was a very serious concern at this time. They were actually really were thinking that in many ways, the United States would be a, a prime target of, of fascism, of a certain kind of populist fascism. You've got to remember in the United States at this time, the, in the 1930s. So this is you know, suffering the repercussions of 1929 and the economic crash. They're in the midst of the Great Depression. Um, the uh, New Deal unfolding. So actually this resonates in, to some extent with our contemporary discussion around Green New Deal. There's, there's a certain echo there. But, and, 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 but they are seriously worried that, that with the you know, with the growing media in the United States and the forms that the media is taking, that it could lend itself to a kind of populist media dominated fascism. And this is actually, this is still, you know, we should think, well, what images come to mind when we talk about fascism? And you might think about, you know, gas chambers or something, or, and, and, and that's obviously the, the repercussions of a very particular form of Nazi fascism that obviously unfolded in, in in Germany, but actually, the the if you like, yeah, you know, what's at the core of fascism is 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 something more subtle, if you like, which is what Walter Benjamin um, theorized as a very particular aestheticization of politics. So a very particular that the, 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 they saw the prime motor of fascism was actually a particular alignment between a kind of populist media and then um, certain interests. And they were looking at the situation in the US at this time and think, okay, we're in danger here. So we've got two things there. On the one hand, we need to support, as, as it then came to pass, the, 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 the war in Europe, that was later. Um, but first, in, in, the, in the 30s still, they were thinking, what can we do as social scientists, as anthropologists? And you've got to remember at this point, they're in their 30s, so they're kind of, full of a certain enthusiasm for applying their ideas in the real world. Um, and they start to develop this model of thinking about museums, thinking about a radical kind of media that could actually not be propaganda, but which would be teaching people how to engage with media, how to produce their own media, and how to, if you like, critically evaluate an emerging media culture. And this is actually the prime work that, that Bateson and Margaret Mead were engaged in in the later 30s. 
And they then became involved in, in something called the Campaign for National Morale, which was about, again, trying to equip, it was kind of curious, but, but, and it was a wider campaign, but it was, it, was a, it was those Americans who were trying to, as it became clear that war in Europe was unfolding, they were the ones campaigning that, that, that the US should support the anti-fascist efforts then in, uh, in, in the, what was it, you know, would become the Second World War. That's then successful, America does engage. And they then, um, and, or, or Bateson at this point, basically has two positions in the early 40s. He gets a position at the Museum of Modern Art in um, New York, where interestingly, he's working with Siegfried Krakauer, the um, you know, important German, um, then emigre theorist. And, and actually then becomes part of the OSS, the, the Office of, of Strategic Services. And again, this is, this is another part where, where in some histories, they'll be sort of saying, oh, Bateson was a part of this. That means that he was, you know, a part of the American state or something, because the OSS is what eventually turns into the CIA. So, you know, so this looks questionable. Um, however, basically, practically everyone interesting in America at that time, and especially emigre intellectuals, become a part of the OSS. So this includes people like Theodore Adorno, the, you know, key Marxist Frankfurt School theorist, Siegfried Krakauer, you know, they're all in the OSS trying to, you know, doing, basically carrying on researching into culture. And in particular, looking at how can they disarm, that there's a propaganda wars going on during the Second World War. And, and Bateson becomes involved in helping to produce propaganda to demoralize um, fascist armies. However, this becomes, after the, after the war, this becomes nonetheless the thing that torments him for the rest of his life. And it's actually a key, becomes a key crisis for him actually. That, that, and we can only understand his very late end work as part of his reflection upon being a propagandist. And, and that this is actually, Mar Bateson and Mead get divorced um, around this time. And it's actually in part around theoretical questions, like in the, in the mid 40s. And it actually, it's actually around theoretical questions where Margaret Mead becomes an ever more household name, if you like, and is very much someone who's using, believes in using social science and anthropology and then later cybernetics directly for social benefit, if you like. So it sort of says, yeah, how can we you know, try to direct society in various ways? Bateson by this time has already become deeply suspicious of this and is already thinking that, that, that you're never in control of those things and it's always going to rebound on you. So he kind of starts retreating from that and becomes and, and delves into more and more very specific studies. So in the 40s, um, they are, oh, amazingly, I've, sorry, I haven't got uh, the Macy conferences written, but obviously the Macy conferences are in the 40s and 50s. Bateson brings, so the Macy conferences, do I need, do, do you guys know what they are? No, okay, so there's a couple of shakes. So just very briefly, so the Macy conferences are a set of key events. There's something like 12 of them in total from 46 to 52, I think it is. Um, and they bring together, it's, it's, it's there that cybernetics is first formalized. So they bring together Warren McCulloch, um, Norbert Wiener, um, Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson are there. And there's basically a mix of mathematicians, biologists, there's a few psychologists, social ecologists, physicists, um, social scientists of various kinds. So, so people from literally a whole field of different disciplines, all of whom are have been realizing and have been in conversation with each other since the 30s. This is why this kind of missile story is just one part of the story. But have been discussing since the 30s how they're all seeing that there are certain principles of organized systems that are, if you like, true of all organized systems, whether you're looking at 
mice or atoms or societies or ecosystems or families, that there are certain principles of organization that are shared with differences, but are shared between those things and that this can be studied and that this needs to be studied. So this is this kind of, you know, this holistic, you know, a non-reductive methodology again, that I was talking about earlier. And so they, they start doing this and, and, and this is where it's, it's through this process that, that cybernetics gets formalized. Wiener publishes the first book in halfway through this process. Um, so Bateson's working through this. At this time, he's working with schizophrenic patients at the Veterans um, Hospital at Palo, Palo Alto in California. And this becomes the kind of seed of, of, of you know, um, a certain intellectual body around Palo Alto more widely. There, there's another key concept emerges in his work of the double bind. Um, so the double bind being, if you like, a, a paradoxical situation of um, where, where, if you like, a, a, a feedback process produces a contradiction. So in, in a, um, you know, if I look at you and I'm signaling with my hands, come here, but I'm saying go away, um, you know, you're placed into a double bind. Which, which messages from me do you, do you, do you work with? He then moves, and I, I, I need to speed up a little bit, but he then moves in the, in the 60s. He's, he starts working with, with dolphin and octopus communication and looking at communications in non-human systems. There's then a key um, set of things that start to happen towards the end of the 60s, where he's becoming more and more connected back into ecological questions. He is... His daughter, Mary Catherine, who had mentioned earlier, in, in uh, one of the texts, she, she starts criticizing his politics again and sort of says, you know, or, or actually being happy that he's becoming politically engaged again. And she sort of says, oh, you've decided to start caring again. She does in one of her prefaces to, to when talking about this later work and, and, and you've stopped deciding that, that all politics is so messed up that you're not going to engage in it and, and you're engaging again and that's good and he talks at this important event called the dialectics of liberation congress that happens in in london and at this you've got stokely carmichael from the black panthers you've it's it's convened by uh, rd lang the the um the the anti-psychiatry um, um activist theorist very interesting and there hit bates and gives the first version of a paper where he outlines what Felix Guattari would later de describe as the three ecologies, but which Guattari directly takes out of a, a couple of um, Bateson's papers at this time, notably the one on, on um, effects of human consciousness on, on, on or human purpose on, on uh, ecological systems. And then he um, basically in, in the last decade, first of all, the Steps to an Ecology of Mind is, 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 is published. And this brings together, based in, in all of the previous years, have been basically just producing, apart from the books that I've mentioned, a vast number of essays in, in all of these different fields and many others actually that, that aren't even in this quick overview. And he, um, and, it, and it gets framed, it gets an important introduction from, um, uh, 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 his research assistant, Mark Engel, that helps to frame it for the emerging counterculture audience that's emerging in the States in the 60s at this time, and which actually his daughter is also a part of, which is kind of pushing him, I think, to, to think once more about these bigger questions. But, the, but the, the, the collection comes out in the early 70s, and then he realizes, okay, there's the possibility of actually synthesizing this now. And in his teaching practice at Santa Cruz, He's teaching this in a more and more holistic and more and more overview way. And that then, come, that then gets brought together in the one important attempt at a synthesis, which is mind and nature, which comes out just before he dies. And then he starts working on another synthesis, the angel sphere, which we'll, which we'll now turn to, um, which isn't completed at the time of his death, but which eventually gets published in 1987 
um, with with Mary Catherine. Um, Oh, just some, and I'm sure you've sort of seen these, just to give a bit of a figure. So this is a very young Bateson and Mead in Bali. I mentioned Schismary Genesis and the two forms of it. Here they are again in, in Bali. This is you know, young Bateson and Mead, so both in their, both in their late 20s here, I guess, maybe early 30s. And again, this actually photograph taken by a um, close friend, C.H. Uh, Waddington. Waddington's actually interesting. Waddington, uh, another one with JBS Haldane. Bateson, an awful lot of Bateson's friends are maverick Marxists. Surprise, yeah. So this is actually something else. Although he never engages in and, and you know, makes various critical comments, but certainly never engages with, with straightforward Marxism politically, an awful lot of his intellectual sparring partners are. And, and so, that, yeah. He's, he's certainly around this. This is then the Bateson group that, that um, in Palo Alto that comes up with double bind theory. Um, yeah, just other things. This is, this is him working in, in uh, Hawaii, at this point looking at dolphin communication. Sometimes this gets written up as he's trying to communicate with dolphins. This up absolutely was not the case. The person that he was working with was John Lilly was. Bateson is there to study communication by studying dolphins. So he's interested in communication beyond the human and looking for principles of communication in non-human species. He's not in any simple way trying to communicate with dolphins. But he is surrounded by, by animals all the time. And OK, so you've just seen this. And in that famous picture, there's Nora with the um, uh, gibbon that they had in their house. OK, and there's that Fred Turner book that I mentioned earlier. So just to give a very quick synthesis, and, I, and you've read the paper, so I won't spend too much time in this, but, but the key kind of insight that I guess Bateson comes to in, in, if you like, the main body of his work and which gets communicated in Steps to an Ecology of Mind can be, uh, hopefully can be captured in, in a few quotes from, and I think these are the really key essays for us. It's worth noting, I think Steps to an Ecology of Mind, it's easier for us today to read it backwards. Don't start at the beginning. I mean, he thought that it was working starting at the beginning, but I think for us today, it doesn't. The, the, if you start at the back, the, the final chapters really directly speak to us, I think, and these bigger ideas, and then you can then move backwards and see how they emerged. But he sort of, you know, so in key, paper, form, substance, and difference. The individual mind is imminent, but not only in the body. It is imminent also in the pathways and messages outside of the body. And there is a larger mind of which the individual mind is only a subsystem, imminent in the total interconnected social system and planetary ecology. So one of the, you know, one of the things that, which, which I think is, is far more accepted today through embodied mind and extended mind theory and, and actually feminist thinking has done a, a massive amount to radicalize how we think about the body. And, and so we're, we've, I think we've moved on largely from thinking that the brain is either literally a soul or it's uh, the mind, sorry, or it's literally in the brain, but it's actually in the brain, in a body embedded in an environment. And that is actually, but Basin was one of the very first to articulate that our sense of self and, and our minds are in no simple sense bounded by our bodies. You know, in fact, it makes no sense to say that. In very important respects, we are all extended beings. That's not to say that you don't have a, a locus of whatever, but yes, yeah, so it goes on. You, know, you and I are so deeply acculturated to the idea of self and organization and species that it's hard to believe that man might view his relations with his environment in any other way. So, you know, the challenge of doing that is becoming one of the things at stake. Thinking like this allows him to propose very radical thesis about how to think about things like pollution um, in the environment. We started to think about ecological systems as mental systems in various ways. So statements like, you decide that you want to get rid of the byproducts of human life that Lake Erie will be a good place to put them. Lake Erie at this time is one of the great lakes in Northern America, surrounded by industry. 
in the by the seventies, so much pollution had just been put into Lake Erie by surrounding automobile and other industries that it was almost dying as a lake. You're having these massive algae blooms that were killing things. This was a photo, aerial photograph of the lake at the time. You can see these massive algae, and then this is you know hundreds of, of miles long lake or something like that. Um, so these these vast things. So you think Lake Erie is a good place to put them. You forget that the eco-mental system called Lake Erie is a part of your wider eco-mental system. And that if Lake Erie is driven insane, its insanity is incorporated into the larger system of your thoughts and experience. So this is from another critical essay, Pathogies, Pathologies of Epistemology. So he's, he's, you know, he's already arrived at this already quite brilliant set of insights about the nature of our relationship to environments how we can actually think about things, how this can transform thinking about things like pollution. And he's thinking about things like, you know, drawing upon his experiences of working with schizophrenia and different mental states, should we say. Um, and he's starting to move on. And so we're now getting towards Angel Sir. So he's starting to think about aesthetics as a, as a mode that can actually help to to join these different bits of the puzzle together. And so we're touching upon some of the terms from your series as a whole now. So he sort of said, so he starts talking about, so by aesthetics, I mean responsiveness to the pattern which connects. So this is a phrase that you've all you know, got in your seminar titles. The pattern which connects is a meta pattern. It's a vast, it is a pattern of patterns. It is that meta pattern which defines the fast generalization that is indeed patterns which connect. And I thought I'd, I'd open Angel's Fear with, with this quote out of Angel's Fear and, and then immediately actually just move in to an exercise. And, and so this is, I've been talking for a bit now and we've still got some more to go, but there's a little exercise that Bateson used to like to set students. And I'm just going to ask you, come on, rabbiting a bit. I'm um, going to ask you to th think about this now. We can, we can spend a few minutes thinking about this. So there's a famous phrase, which, which you certainly will have come across because it's in the, in the title where he sort of says, what, what connects the, the orchid to the primrose and the lobster, the crab to the lobster, and both of them to me and me to you? So what is that? Yeah, so, so I mean, this is, I'm just going to sort of throw this out. Yeah, if we look at these four things here, how do we start to approach thinking about that. And I don't know, have you guys tried to do this exercise at all yet? Okay, so, so I'll, I'll, has anyone got any, yeah, just, so. Yeah. Looking so at that now. It's an open question. So would yeah. I like to yeah. respond to that? How would we start to do this? How do we start to, you know, draw connections between the top two images or the bottom two images? So one of the things that he used to do sometimes, particularly using the kind of crab examples, there, there was one time where he, he turned up with students and just had a box full of, of bits of crabs that he just picked up from a, a fishmongers or whatever. And he sort of said, right, imagine that you're on another planet and somehow these have arrived there, God knows how. How are you going to produce arguments that these are the remains of living things? So that's a kind of different version of this exercise. So looking at these things, how Can might I, you, <coughs> what are sorry. the connections between these things or how might you make arguments that these are living rather than? Thank you, Sonia, I think she had yep. a comment. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's the, the idea. I think they're all living organisms. How do you know that? And they have, they consume energy. That's certainly true but you're bringing outside knowledge to bear on that at the moment. So that's, I mean, that is, that both of those statements are true and they're actually both good statements. Um, but just looking at these pictures at the moment, so just really just looking at the formal questions. And actually this is one of the interesting things why actually Bateson is interesting within the field of aesthetics and thinking architecturally and so on is, is that he's actually a very formal thinker. and and. If you whenever you talk to his students or so on, that they one of the things that constantly comes up was his like skills of description. I think this is probably something that he that his father drilled into, yeah, you know, as, as a biologist and, and as a as a, a very keen, you know, it's, it's just really, really carefully observing what you're looking at. 
So just formally, just looking literally at shapes and so on, what are we seeing here? Well, they're kind of having complex shapes and are rounded and seem to be differentiated in itself. Like there's stems, there's petals, there's claws, there's legs, there's bodies. Okay, great. So yeah, so that, that's, that's really useful. So we're seeing differentiation, we're seeing repetition. Um, uh, yeah, there's a pattern also. Yeah. It's like yeah. that uh, it always creates sameness in difference. Ah, okay, very good. Yes. Give me some examples. Um, Either you or anyone else. And if you look at the back of the lobster, these segments are similar, but not the same. Yeah. And they seem like they elongate themselves along of a more general shape. Mm -hmm. yep. Also the colors. Yep. Yep. So we've got a gradation in shape. We've got gradations in colors. We've got repetition with difference. And so the lobster tail is one example of that. The different petals are examples of that. But what's going on in some of the petals? There's an important word we haven't used yet. It seems to be a direction towards the center of the orchid. So also it has a weight. center, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also weighed towards the center with the primrose. Uh, there's like a general sense of direction, but it's not defined. You get it, like it connects. But it's mm -hmm. also relation of symmetry. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's symmetry. This is, so, so there's what kinds of symmetries have we got going on here? And we, when we can look at both of these clusters now. Well, definitely a symmetry that's kind of just mirrored in the yep. middle, like there's a spine along the spine of the so animals. In the, so we're seeing that something like that in the orchid and the crab and the lobster. And, and I, uh, yeah, and there's probably a, not, yeah, there is a, actually a, a, a axial symmetry in the primrose also, but the primrose also has a um, rotational radial symmetry. Are the crab and the lobster, are they absolutely symmetrical? I mean, the primrose looks like it might be absolutely, uh, sorry, that, sorry, the orchid, potentially one of those flowers does have a perfect plane of symmetry. Is that true of the crab and the lobster? No, the crab has a larger and a Right, yeah, so we've part. actually got, so we've got symmetry, but we've also got symmetry breaking going on. And there's a fantastic essay in Steps actually around symmetry breaking that it builds on his father's work actually. So there's something very interesting odd about the Bateson family is they do actually all somehow carry on each other's work, um, which is kind of interesting as a, as a mini cybernetic group, I guess. But um, yes, yeah, so, so his father did some in interesting work noticing that there are certain kinds of deformations. For example, there are people who don't have a thumb and instead of having a thumb, they have another four fingers. His father was never able to explain this, but actually Gregory Bateson does, and it's in steps where he actually sort of says, well, actually what's missing, even though there's, four, you know, there's more appendages going on, what's happened is that there's, some in, that, that there's some information missing about a thumb and that actually symmetry breaking is the introduction of information and when that information is missing, what then the, the, the morphology of the hand falls back on is an earlier symmetry, which would be just two sets of four fingers all on one hand. So it's a very interesting relationship between symmetry and information that happens actually in that paper. But as you said, we've actually got that here. Okay, I, I mean, you, you guys can quite, and you can, you can reflect upon this a bit. There's... It's quite a nice breakdown. Is that provoked from the relation uh, to the environment? Sorry, say that again. Uh, if that uh, break on symmetry is uh, provoked or enhanced. Ah, well, it by can be, yes, indeed. And, and, and I mean, that's, a, that's again a fantastic question to ask because 
in all kinds of ways, organisms rely on environments to give them that kind of information. So it's, it's, it's actually very often involving environmental questions of some kind. I don't know, I, I think actually in, in, the, in the case of the, the hand example, I think that's actually some, some missing genetic information. I'm not absolutely sure. But there's all kinds of examples actually, and, and these are ones that Bateson enjoys talking about in various places. So for example, there's, with, with certain animals that have quite large eggs, so he gives an example, I know he gives an example of, of donkeys and I think frogs actually as well, that you can, if you take the egg and you just like take a pin or a hair and um, penetrate the egg with that, you're basically re replacing the mechanical action of the sperm, but without there being a sperm, that would still be enough for those eggs to fertilize and produce an animal it, it, so, so you can get a donkey just by piercing the egg because what the egg is waiting for amongst other things is a plane of symmetry to be defined between its two poles of a cell by the sperm entering. And so just by penetrating it, you give it that plane of symmetry and it will start then dividing and multiplying and will make a new donkey. The donkey will be missing half of, it, of the code that it would have got from the sperm that it's missing so it would be infertile and, and maybe some other thing but you could you yeah but there's lots of examples where actually this kind of information and, and symmetry and the introduction of it from an environment um it, you know is, is key to this so that, that's a great question there's also a nice discussion of this if you wanted to explore this further there, there's some interesting essays in, in this book biosemiotics or gregory bateson as a precursor to biosemiotics so biosemiotics is actually one of these fields, again, quite tangential to a lot of the ecological feminist stuff of looking at, at uh, you know, biological systems or semiotic systems. And, and Bateson's work being interesting. And this was just quite a nice diagram that comes out of one of those in there where, where we can start to see, you know, taking that exercise further. So there's a certain repetition within the parts of the limbs as, as, as one of you rightly showed and then the repetition of those so we, we get those and then there's the symmetry and the symmetry breaking so these are in in terms of these we get this is actually this doesn't we can talk about these being first order and second order patterns this doesn't this doesn't mean the same as the first and second order in terms of the history of cybernetics but just nested patterns so, so one is one is within the limbs and then they get repeated as multiple limbs then you can get some changes within those and then we can start to compare these things we can actually now start to compare the orchid and the primrose and the lobster and the crab together so, so we can see that compare their second order relations in one and the second order relations in another and actually see another set of relations between very very different species or we might note our own symmetries that we're spotting within both of those so it's a great, Bateson was very good at coming up with these kinds of puzzles that you can really meditate upon in the manner of a kind of, you know, uh, something to reflect upon. And, God, I really am spinning. I'm actually just going to, you, you can go back and you've got these now on the screen and it's being recorded. So you can go back and read some of these, um, read some of these things. So we've had that quote already. So, so, what is it that he's starting to look at in these concepts of aesthetics and in this kind of concept of the sacred? And part of it gets captured in this kind of quote where he sort of says, well, when we focus too narrowly upon parts, we fail to see the necessary characteristics of a whole. And we're then tempted to ascribe phenomena which actually result from wholeness to some supernatural entity. This is a kind of critique of a great deal of pre-existing thinking. And these are just some sections. So I'll leave these on the page for a little bit so you, you can kind of sort of come back and read some of these. This is from the introduction to Angel's Theory, where he's describing the outstanding work which he thinks he hasn't yet had time to do. And a bit like some of this I've already, or quite a bit of this I've already kind of set out for you in various ways. So the critique of existing Western thinking, the problem of dualism and mind and matter. He then talks through his own um, 
intellectual trajectory, a great deal of which I've already spoken to you about. Um, and, but he ends up and gives us some clues straight away about this, this important job that he feels you know, still hasn't had enough said about it, which is, and, and if we just look at this last paragraph in the introduction here, um, which is the title of the present book is intended to convey a warning. It seems that every important scientific advance provides tools which look to be just what the applied scientists and engineers had hoped for. And usually these gentry jump in without much more ado. So yeah, the, 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 they want to make a warning about scientific tools. Um, their well-intentioned efforts usually do as much harm as good. I mean, you can see the parallels with the Engels statement earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, they're almost saying the same. Almost as much harm as good serving at best to make conspicuous the next layer of problems, which must be understood before the applied scientists can be trusted not to do gross damage. Um, behind every scientific advance, there is always a matrix, a mother load of unknowns out of which new partial answers have been chiseled. But the hungry, overpopulated, sick, ambitious and competitive world will not wait, we are told, till more isn't known, but must rush in where angels tread. Um, and I have very little sympathy for these arguments from the world's need. Um, I notice that those who pander to its needs are often well paid. I distrust the applied scientists claim to do what they, what, the, what they do is useful or necessary. I suspect that their impatient youth enthusiasm for action, their raring to go, is not just a symptom of impatience, nor is it pure buccaneering ambition. I suspect that it covers a deep epistemological panic. So we've got here, I, th I thought this was an interesting thing to pull out because it actually sets out both a certain kind of politics, but also a caution about it. And almost, if you like, a meta-political problem. And so, so Bateson sort of saw, Bateson's kind of argument here is, is that there's a problem about what he, what he thinks is this epistemological panic that we're, um, that we're constantly trying to ignore, which is that the fundamentals of Western thinking fundamentally don't make sense. That they, you know, that they cut up the world into ways in which um, uh, are damaging. Now, this is this is precisely where um, it's going to come. This is precisely where some of the questions around the the sacred um, emerge in his thinking. And so, if if we saw that in his bigger body of work, he was, he was saying, okay, that actually we should think about the whole world as a nest of mental systems, as an ecology of mind. Now, within that. We ourselves are also an ecology of mind. Now, within that, we have something that we call self-consciousness and that we make decisions, what he calls conscious purpose, or we make individual plans. So we're now talking about planning, at, if you like, at an individual level, but also at a social level. Now, the big danger that Bateson saw was that our consciousness is only a consciousness, it's not even a consciousness of our whole selves. In fact, we're deluded about the nature of our own selves, that we don't see our extended ecologies of mind and we mistake our consciousness, what we're conscious of as our whole selves. And that this then is, you know, so his description, again, another essay in, in steps that I would strongly encourage you to read is, is the alco alcoholism one. Could just give such a great, introduction to his theory of self and his theory of pathologies in various ways and so he actually you know one of the points that he's making is actually in many ways the alcoholic has a more correct epistemology than if you like western science because they at least recognize and the alcoholism in, in his interpretation is a kind of attempt to bond with this external world that we know we're a part of but somehow we don't feel like we are so that the, the kind of engagement with the bottle is almost a statement, you know, I need this external world. And then, but it's a pathological, um, it's, it's kind of more correct, but also pathological, if you like. Now, so what is the sacred in, in, in Bateson's description? Why, why does he um, think that this is important? So the sacred basically becomes the, the relationship between 
the what you're consciously aware of individually and the reality of the bigger ecology of mind that you're not normally consciously aware of but which through aesthetic approaches you're able to get glimpses of so he's the basic thesis is that you have um um yeah so, so we and, and and these these descriptions at, at an individual level also if you like work for organizations or for for social thinking that in um you know in in the models of um if you like pre-capitalist or not or some non-capitalist societies and and when bateson was like looking doing his anthropological work looking at the myth and, and religious and magic structures of these societies, that he was seeing both the same dilemmas that face us of, of individuals, their, their struggles within a culture, but he was then seeing, in some cases at least, and, but each culture was different, sets of myths and stories which were effectively isomorphic that is they had the same shape the same patterns of connections that that you would see in bigger ecosystems and that the myths would tell would basically have the form ecological form even though you know the, the superficial content might be all kinds of stories about various you know whatever it might be deities and forest beings and so on and so forth but the structures would actually have, would be modeled on the environments of these communities. And so th these stories would actually make available to non-conscious, the non-rational parts of your mind would give you a framework for actually understanding ecological systems in some way. That actually that's what the, that's what the bigger form of these stories was doing. And it's that relationship between the, um, if you like, the, the conscious moment and if you like the poetic moment of, or the aesthetic moment of perceiving through myths, through analogies, through metaphors, the way in which these bigger systems are working. And that, the, and that we can not only, that our minds are always doing that. I mean, that's that's what they're doing in their various non-conscious work. And that we're able to access some of that through these other forms of processes and that the sacred was about that relationship. So the sacred for him is the, about the relationship between the part and the whole, if you like, but at, at, a, at the concept of mind. Now, I'm, I'm going to run through some pages again, just because there, there's material which, if you're interested, you can revisit. So this is another one of Bateson's exercises, which is a, actually a very nice one. And, and, and he used quite a lot in some of his later essays, which was actually just a really, really simple one, which is just spend some time looking at your hand. And you can kind of sort of start to do it now, but actually, as he says, yeah, sp spend some time doing it. Later six, it says, you know, if I ask you how many fingers you have, you will probably answer five. That I believe to be an incorrect answer. The correct answer is, Gregory, you're asking a question wrongly. So you think he's basically saying that's the wrong art, the wrong question to ask. To ask a question about quantities of objects, that's mechanistic thinking of cutting the world up into objects. What we want to do is to train ourselves to see relationships and processes. And he says that if you do that, in, you know, in the process of human growth, there is surely no word that means finger and no word that means five, i.e. within your genetics, within your story. But what, the, what there surely is, he argues, is the relation between one and two and the relation between two and three and between three and four. And, four. and, the, and, and, the, he, sort of, and he repeatedly sort of says this, if, if you spend some time looking at this, he says, look at your hand now. I don't know if you can do it in a public place like this. He wasn't anticipating a Zoom room, but he might as well have been. I recommend you take your hand home and take a look at it when you get there, very quietly, almost as a part of a meditation. 
and try to catch the difference between seeing it as a base for five parts and seeing it as constructed out of a tangle of relationships. Not a tangle, he says, but actually a pattern of the interlocking of relationships, which were the determinants of its growth. And it's, it's actually a fantastic exercise. You, you will start to see things. So do spend some time um, looking at your fingers. Um, there's, okay, I'm just gonna let you see this. So these, these are all in uh, Angel Sphere, which you can get a copy of, but this is, this is some excerpts. Um, oh, sorry, no, this is actually some further stories about that. Okay, this is uh, the end of this where he talks about the paradox of not knowing how to teach or you know one of the things that he's asking is how do we teach this stuff how do we teach this kind of thinking and he ends that actually in, in, in this question here so an awful lot of his of, of his final years was actually trying to come up with little exercises like this for, for sort of seeing how can we break down our normal ways of seeing things and and start to see pattern and relationship and process more than objects and 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 selves I knew that I was never not going to squeeze anything in, but I'd actually underestimated just how little I was going to squeeze in. <laughs> the second chapter in Angel Sphere is called The World of Mental Process, on which I can barely touch upon, although a great number of the themes I've already been able to, um, um, to look at. So, so he, he rehearses some of the questions around um, uh, mind and nature. The key, why does that stop moving? There's, oh, there's this, um, do we need to stop at half past exactly or can we overrun slightly? Mm, slightly, I guess, but I guess it would be nice to kind of have a few questions. If, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna leave, try to spend time to have a look at um, this syllogism. Now, actually in, in the, issue of footprints that, that Dalmini was, was so kind to invite us to and put together. We actually spend a little, myself and Ben spend a little bit of time discussing this. So um, have a look at that. So that's, um, okay, so, so what I just really wanted to end on, and this is it's really is the last thing, but, but the, these questions, you know, essentially the, the problem that's being posed is it is a bit like another version of, of Ross Ashby's law of requisite variety in a certain kind of way, which is that how do we go about planning in systems that we know have a complexity that we can't begin to capture, that it's just simply not possible to directly model these things or to engage with them. But we know that we need to do that if you like, you know, so the climate crisis, the environmental crisis that we're in now, we need to urgently do some things, but the some things that we're going to do, almost certainly, even if they're the ones that seem as accurate and as correct as possible at the moment, almost certainly you're going to have some unintended consequences that we can't know about. And more generally, how do we go about engaging with systems in an open manner of, 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 of a kind of open conversation with complexity, if you like. And so he, there's a, there was an unpublished um, essay that I found in his, his archives that was around, you know, how we should retrain engineers to be more holistic thinkers. And, so, and, and we could use this for kind of, you know, the same question of, of, of what was one of the problems at COP last week. So we sort of say, we might say the first task in ecological engineering is not to solve problems, but to identify them. But even this phrasing takes us back to the engineer's philosophy that problems are in fact identifiable and solvable in the first place. The systemic philosophy, which must guide the biological planner is not like that and is still largely unexplored and is I think still largely unexplored to this day. These are actually, just want to show you a few excerpts from the archive as well. These, these are some excerpts from his notebooks at these moments. Um, yeah, I won't touch upon those. Okay, let's, I mean, it'd be, it'd be great to, to 
Yeah, so, so one of the things that I'm trying to rise about is, is actually that this, how can we fold in reflections upon um, you know, using some tools like, or concepts like aesthetic and the sacred to introduce into things like, you know, the, the political discussions around the Green New Deal that we might be having today. Um, okay. Okay, then. Thank you very much, John. Uh, so, and okay. I, will, I will keep in touch and yep. we will see what happens <laughs> as yes, it great. progresses. Thank okay. you, then. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for staying around. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.